to today's Medical Alley webinar titled Market Access for Groundbreaking Treatments, a Case Study for Pulsed Field Ablation or PFA. My name is Ben Wagner. I'm delighted to be your host for today's webinar. Uh, before we kick things off, I really do want to say just a, a big thank you to our sponsor, Clarivate, for making this webinar possible um, and for shining a light on such an innovative and transformative uh, technology. We've had many conversations about this here within the Medical Alley community, and we're excited to advance another conversation related to PFA here today. Uh, Clarivate is a company that connects people and organizations to intelligence they can trust to transform their perspective, their work, and our world. And we are proud to have them as a Medical Alley partner here today. So before we introduce our panel of experts, you can see there on the right side of your screen, just a couple of quick notes and some uh, framework for the conversation. Today's discussion is being recorded, so you will receive a link afterward if you would like to rewatch this webinar or if you'd like to ascend to a colleague, we encourage you to do that. If you have any questions, we'll have just a couple of minutes at the end of today's webinar to answer them. Uh, so you can put that into the Q&A function at the bar below titled Q&A and you can type those questions in. And again, we'll have a few minutes at the end to answer them. So today's webinar will focus on pulse field ablation, which is really pushing the boundaries of medical technology. But with such cutting edge treatments come significant challenges from financial uncertainties to shifting regulatory landscapes and global adoption hurdles. In today's session, we'll explore how global partners are addressing these obstacles, paying close attention to key areas like safety, efficacy, financial implications, and the importance of clinical differentiation, especially in cases where baseline data is limited. So with that, I'm thrilled to welcome our panelists here in this morning to share their insight and their expertise on this topic. Uh, with us today is Annette Boyle, who is the editor of BioWorld MedTech. Dee Chaudhry is a principal of commercial strategy and consulting with Clarivate. Ankil Gandhi is a senior team lead of MedTech Insights with Clarivate. Dr. David Begley is joining us here today as well. He is the Clinical Director of Cardiology at Royal Papworth Hospital. And finally, Julianne Ray will moderate today's discussion. She is the Global Head of MedTech Strategy at Clarivate. Julianne, uh, I'm excited to turn it over to you now to continue this discussion. Thank you so much, Ben. And thank you to everyone for joining today's webinar on pulsed field ablation. PFA has taken the AFib market by storm, leading to rapid changes in patient care. A year ago, I don't know how many of us would have predicted just how quickly this technology would be adopted. Clarivate covered the PFA market in our MedTech Technologies to Watch report that was published earlier this year. And in a few short months, the market has moved so quickly that we expect many of us are struggling to keep pace. In today's webinar, we're bringing together clinical, market access, and market trend experts to explore how this, how this technology got its start where it's heading, and how the market is evolving. I'm filled, thrilled to dive into PFA as a case study for what went right with market access. Now to our experts. Um, we'll start with Annette. Annette, can you begin by giving us an overview of pulsed field ablation and why it matters? Sure, thanks for the question, Julianne. Uh, at the beginning of this year, as you said, Clarivate projected PFA would represent 50% of cardiac ablations for atrial fibrillation and would be a $3 billion market by 2028. Now it appears the market's going to be twice that size and PFA will take a much larger share more quickly than anticipated. We'll talk more about that in a few minutes. PFAs reconfigured the electrophysiology market specifically as a treatment for atrial fibrillation. That's important because atrial fibrillation is the most common type of cardiac arrhythmia, and it affects about 60 million people globally. I never expect to nearly double, as you can see here, by 2050. AFib can cause chest pain, shortness of breath, fatigue, dizziness. Most importantly, though, it increases the risk of stroke 500%, triples the risk of heart failure, doubles the risk of dementia and early mortality. So it's something you definitely want to fix. Cardiac ablation offers a cure, but 95% of patients are managed with medications that they need to take for the rest of their lives. So from an electrophysiology point of view, from a medtech point of view, it offers a massively underpenetrated patient population. 
it's worth noting there are two kinds of uh, primary kinds of atrial fibrillation or AFib, proximal, which comes and goes in intervals of a week or less, and persistent, which lasts more than a week and often requires cardioversion or an electric shock to the heart to restore a regular rhythm. In the US to date, PFA has only been FDA approved to treat proximal afibrillation, but it's used in many centers to treat persistent AFib. Several studies are in process now that appear quite likely to support that use. So that's where we are today and why it really matters, Julianne. Thank you, Annette. David, now on to you. As an electrophysiologist on the front lines working directly with patients, what can you tell us about how you treat AFib and the different types of ablation devices? Thank you, Julianne. I mean, we've, we've been as a community ablating cardiac rhythm problems for many decades now, and radio frequency has been the main energy source since the mid-90s. Delivering radio frequency waves to cardiac tissues results in the generation of heat, and that consequently causes discrete tissue necrosis or cell death which in turn blocks the transmission of electrical signals critical for the electrical properties of the heart in that particular area. Cardiac arrhythmias are caused by a, ver a variety of mechanisms, but in the case of atrial fibrillation, spontaneous signals arising from the area surrounding the veins, returning blood from the lungs to the back of the heart, are thought to collide with the normal signals resulting in the generation of a more chaotic rhythm, often leading to a faster regular heart rate, which is inefficient and can cause palpitations, breathlessness, fatigue, or lightheadedness. Eliminate, eliminating these extra signals by encircling the veins with a line of ablation has been the mainstay of treatment of atrial fibrillation since the late 1990s. So the catheter at the top of this slide is a, is a radio frequency catheter that is used to create these lines of ablation by painstakingly moving it around the veins, creating contiguous points of ablation. This process is labor intensive and time consuming and it's essential to provide complete durable lesions around the veins to prevent recurrence. Over the years, a number of attempts have been made to create radio frequency catheters that can complete this encirclement in one go, what are known as single shot catheters. However, the use of single shot catheters has only really taken off following the introduction of the cryoballoon catheters here pictured on the left. Instead of heating the cardiac tissue, the balloon is used to temporarily occlude the vein and cools to between minus 40 to minus 60 degrees, resulting in circumferential ablation. Both of these thermal energy sources can result in complications by causing damage to adjacent structures, such as nerves to either the stomach or the diaphragm, or to the gullet, which runs directly down the back wall of the heart. In the case of the latter, this can result in a hole or a fistula developing between the heart and the gullet, which is frequently fatal. Fortunately, this is extremely rare. In addition, any tissue that is damaged by ablation will contract as it scars, and therefore it is essential that ablation is around the veins and not within, as any contraction will result in narrowing or even occlusion of the vein. Electroporation is a method that has been around for decades in medicine. Poration or creating holes in the surface or membrane of cells is caused by applying an electrical pulse or pulsed field um, around the area. Initially, this poration is reversible, but will allow delivery of large molecules such as drugs or fragments of DNA to cells. Um, irreversible electroporation of cells results in cell de death and therefore has been an area of interest for cardiac ablation for many years. And this is where pulse field ablation comes in and the far away catheter pictured here at the bottom of the slide. Um, this was purpose built for the delivery of pulse field ablation and therefore the subject of, of, of this presentation. Punkil, you covered market projections for PFA. Can you give us some deeper insights on those projections? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Julianne, for the question. And uh, you know what? The market for pulse field ablation is showing tremendous growth potential. Um, if you look at the global market size for atrial fibrillation treatments, it was estimated to be at $6 billion in 2023. Within that, PFA market stood at only about $300 million. But what is really exciting is that the PFA market is projected to reach $7 billion in the next five years, that is by 2028. And this represents a compound annual growth rate of over 85%, which is definitely substantial. 
this rapid growth is being driven by several key factors some of which dr begley just explained let me summarize them for you so first and foremost the, there is growing clinical evidence from trials such as pulsed af advent and many others and these have demonstrated that pfa is not only effective treatment but it's also a safer option when you compare it with traditional ablation methods like radio frequency and cryoablation Another key factor that's driving the adoption of PFA is the significantly shorter procedure time compared to traditional methods like RF and cryoablation. And this increased efficiency allows facilities to perform more ablation procedures within the same time frame. And as a result, many centers are seeing a reduction in patient backlog. And in some cases, waiting periods that once stretched to several months are now being shortened and facilities are expecting to treat more patients each day due to the streamlined nature of PFA procedures. This operational efficiency is actually helping to address capacity constraints in many hospitals and clinics. What is also worth noting, in my opinion, is that there is a shift in clinical practice. So uh, many, many electrophysiologists are now switching to PFA as their first line of treatment. As Dr. Begley just pointed out, RF used to be the very first option in the early years. But now with the advent of PFA, it has become the last. And cryoablation is actually just serving as a primary backup for redo procedures. Uh, also, the pipeline, if you see the pipeline of these PFA devices is very strong and many newer PFA systems are anticipated to be launched in the coming few years. And this in turn will drive adoption and accelerate market growth. So overall, Julianne, we're looking at a market that's really on the verge of transformation and with PFA rapidly becoming the dominant force in the treatment of atrial fibrillation, this growth is kind of underpinned by strong clinical evidence and improved procedural efficiency, all of which point to PFA playing a central role in the future of cardiac ablation. Wow, thank you, Pankel. Exciting times. So from a market size and growth perspective, what can you tell us about the players and who's taking the lead? There is strong competition in this field and there are a few key players that are actually leading the charge. So if you start with Boston Scientific, they were actually the first ones to enter the market. Their journey kind of began with the acquisition of a company called Farapulse and their Farapulse device received first ever CMARC approval for a PFA system in Europe. And this kind of gave them a significant early mover advantage. And as a result, this Farapulse device has been available globally for a longer period of time compared to many other competitors and which in turn has helped the company secure a strong foothold in the market. Meanwhile, if you look at Metronic, Metronic has made its move into the PFA space through acquisition of a company called Afera. And their Afera Sphere 9 PFA system received CMARC approval in March 2023. And they soon followed up with the approval for their internally developed device called the Pulse Select system. Metronic also crossed a significant milestone by becoming the first company to receive FD approval for their Pulse Select system in the US. And this approval gave them a head start in the US market. Boston Scientific wasn't far enough though. So if you see just one month after Metronic getting approval, Boston Scientific also secured an FD approval in the US for its own device. If you look at Johnson & Johnson, Johnson & Johnson Medtech has a device called Varipulse PFA system. This device is also available in Europe. And this company, JNJ Medtech, is making strides in Asia as well. They got Japanese regulatory approval from MHLW for their Varipulse uh, system in January 2024, which was actually the very first device to enter the Japanese market. And Medtronic soon followed. If you look at the situation in China, the companies over there have actually benefited from their regulatory authority, which is called NMPA. So NMPA has a fast track review program, and these companies have really benefited from them. So there's a company called Jinjiang Electronic, and it entered the market with approval of their PFA system in January 2024. And they were soon followed by another Chinese company called Denuo Electrophysiology. And they launched their device in March 2024. So these were the two very first PFA systems that were actually approved in China. And they were followed by devices like Farapulse. And just recently, Medtronic received NMP approval for Pulse Select September this month. So if you look at the 
competitive landscape globally, Boston Scientific's Farah Pulse has had the advantage of being the first to market and is therefore leading the charge. We're also seeing other multinationals and regional competitors gaining traction, especially if as PFA devices continue to secure approvals in these key markets. So Julian, overall, the competition is really intense and we're likely to see further consolidation and innovation in this space as more companies seek to kind of differentiate their PFA technologies. David, on to you. Can you tell us from a provider's perspective why cardiac centers are adopting the technology so quickly and how you're seeing these changes play out with cryo RF ablation versus PFA? One of the main advantages of pulse field ablation and what has caused, I think, the greatest excitement amongst the EP community is its tissue specificity. Uh, that is, it causes death, um, cell death of heart muscle cells, which transmit the electrical signals, but leaves the, the architecture around those cells and surrounding structures unharmed. So as a result, there's no contraction of the cardiac tissues that might cause narrowing of the veins and other structures such as nerves or the lining of the gullet are spared. And therefore, there's less risk of collateral damage to adjacent structures. Other inherent risks of cardiac ablation, though, do still exist, such as stroke or cardiac perforation, um, which are independent of the energy source. Pulse field ablation is, however, quite stimulating to surrounding muscles and nerves and therefore requires either general anesthesia or deep sedation at present. Although this requirement may change over time with refinement of the technology and increasing comfort in its use. I think the big issue is speed of delivery. That's, that's, that's the other main advantage. Each electrical pulse itself takes two and a half seconds. And the dosing required for durable ablation means eight or 10 energy applications across four or five veins, meaning a total of maybe 30 to 50 applications and a, and a total of two to three minutes of actual ablation time. And this compares well to about 30 minutes, 30 to 45 minutes of radio frequency or 20 minutes of cryoablation. The result is shorter procedures and less time spent in the left atrium, which is beneficial in terms of, of the overall risks. The Farah Pulse system that we've heard about has been in development for over 10 years and, and commercial use over the last three to four years. So therefore exists a good body of evidence to support its use. And I'm not going to go through them all, but I mentioned just a few of the studies which uh, the names have already cropped up. The ADVENT trial was a, was a prospective non-inferiority randomized trial with patients randomized to either Farapulse or to normal standard of care using thermal ablation, that is either radio frequency or cryo balloon. 65 operators took part across 30 centers in, in, in North America with 607 patients randomized. And this showed that pulse field ablation was non-inferior to thermal ablation in terms of the, the primary endpoints on safety and effectiveness. And it also demonstrates a reduction in procedure times, left atrial dwell time, that's the amount of time spent in the left side of the heart, and ablation time. And I think importantly for the planning of lists, there was also less variability in procedure times. Um, you know, the, the, the standard deviation of the whole procedure time is very small compared to other, other to, um, energy sources. Um, a sub-analysis showed significantly greater reduction in atrial arrhythmia burden compared to thermal ablation, and patients with atrial arrhythmia burdens that are very small had reduced risk of need for redo ablation, cardioversion, or hospitalization, all of which add to the cost of atrial fibrillation. The manifest PF registry was a European multinational registry across 24 centres and 77 operators, which included over 1,500 patients. And this showed that PFA using Farrowave catheter was clinically effective and safe for the treatment of atrial fibrillation. The follow-up Manifest 17K registry enrolled over 17,000 patients over a two-year period from 106 centres and demonstrated an improvement in safety with reduction in vascular complications, particularly with the use of ultrasound. Perfect PATH was recently presented at the European Society of Cardiology as a late-breaking trial, and this enrolled 269 patients with predominantly paroxysmal AF, randomized to either pay, um, PFA or cryoablation and demonstrated improved effectiveness, safety, and again, predictability of procedure time, leading to overall reduction in costs for patients treated with PFA. So not only is PFA as effective, if not better than thermal ablation, procedures are associated with fewer complications, are quicker, and with less variation in procedure time, which allows better use of resources. From a personal perspective, in our institution, we've been using predominantly cryo balloon for first-time ablation of AF, 
and reserving radio frequency for redo procedures. Since the introduction of PFA um, over two years ago, my own practice has shifted to almost exclusively using PFA for first time ablation and some redos as it was more forgiving technology for odd anatomy. Um, but this is um, with a caveat that general anesthesia is available to me. And I see this trend um, will continue. D, as PFA and cardiac ablation procedures continue to grow, the impact will extend beyond companies offering pulsed field ablation devices or other types of ablation devices. Can you talk about how this will impact the broader healthcare ecosystem and other stakeholders? The broader market implications for the adoption of PFA are really significant, but they're also multifaceted. So while we know the adoption of PFA is poised to significantly impact the cardiac ablation market, it'll drive growth, innovation, improve patient care, all the things we've been discussing. The increased adoption of pulse field ablation is likely to have several impacts on adjacent markets. So let's just break down what that means for these various stakeholders. The medical device market. So you're going to see more innovation and competition. And as the demand for specialized catheters, generators, and other equipment grows, the manufacturers are going to continue to need to innovate and create more advanced and efficient devices. This could lead to a competitive market where the companies are constantly striving to offer the best technology. We're also gonna see market expansion. Huckle uh, you know, touched on that. We may see smaller companies and startups entering the market with fresh ideas and possibly more disruptive technology. So this could diversify the market as it stands today and provide even more options for healthcare providers. Now let's talk about healthcare services. These institutions are gonna to have to have new training and certification. And with PFA procedures becoming more common, there's gonna be a need for specialized training programs for cardiologists and even the technicians. Medical institutions might need to develop new certification programs to ensure that the professionals are up to date with the latest techniques. We also have aspects of workforce demand. So the rise in the PFA procedures could lead to an increased demand for healthcare professionals, creating even more job opportunities and encouraging more people to enter the field of cardiology. Shift in drug demand is gonna be an issue. And since PFA offers this minimally invasive alternative, that demand for the traditional antiarrhythmic drugs may decrease from the 90% level that Annette mentioned earlier. However, on the flip side, there could be an increased demand for drugs that complement PFA. So maybe uh, products that could manage post-procedural inflammation and prevent complications. Then there's this whole aspect of new drug development and combining PFA with pharmaceutical treatments that could lead to development of new drugs specifically uh, designed to enhance effectiveness of PFA and manage side effects. The final thing is going to be insurance and healthcare costs and coverage policies. The, the insurance company to need to update their policy to include coverage for all aspects of the PFA procedures. This could have involved really assessing the cost effectiveness of PFA compared to traditional methods and adjusting these reimbursement models accordingly. And if that cost effectiveness um, you know, really plays out in the long run, it could lead to lower healthcare costs for patients and insurers and might also influence the pricing and the reimbursement strategy of both payers and providers. So with long-term efficacy in R&D, you're gonna see an increased adoption. It's gonna to continue to drive research into long-term outcomes. It'll help establish more um, overall effectiveness and safety over time, and it'll lead to improvement in technology. So the final thing, I guess, I wanna mention, I did say final before, but I'm, I'm lying. The research really might also uncover some new uses for PFA beyond cardiac ablation and potentially expand its impact into other areas of medicine, which really could open up a whole new avenue of treatment and further innovation in the field. So uh, in our opinion, from a market access perspective and peripheral markets, the adoption of PFA is set to 
create significant changes across various sectors. It's going to foster innovation, improve patient care, and potentially reduce healthcare costs. So it's really an exciting time to be in this medical field as these advancements continue to unfold. We'll turn it over to Annette. Annette, will you shed some light on what conditions exist to create such a fast-moving technology? There you go. I wanted to touch on something that David mentioned first uh, about some of the risks of thermal ablation, because I think that really is driving some of the enthusiasm on the part of physicians. Uh, you know, thermal esophageal injury occurs in about one in 10,000 cases. It's very rare, but frequently fatal. Uh, and John Madrola, an EP, recently wrote that globally half of experienced EPs say their center has had such an event. Well, PFA takes that very small risk to zero, and that's very appealing. So that's one factor. In addition, changes in guidelines have expanded the indications for catheter ablation and moved it to a first line therapy ahead of medication, right, to achieve early rhythm control. Uh, in April, uh, an international consensus statement, uh, European, Latin American, Asian, uh, specifically called out the safety of PFA as one of the reasons for making catheter ablation that a first line treatment in patients with symptoms and recurrent atrial fibrillation, patients resistant or intolerant to antiarrhythmic drugs, and individuals with heart failure. Uh, in June, the American College of Cardiology guidelines for atrial fibrillation moved catheter ablation to a class one recommendation for similar groups of patients. Um, it's now also a class 2A recommendation for patients with symptomatic AFib or asymptomatic atrial fibrillation in whom it may reduce progression and those with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So that has really increased the the potential market for this procedure, the population who can be treated. And it has changed, as you can see here, what we expect to be the distribution of the kind of um, technology that is used for ablation here. 2023, it, uh, PFA was only 5% of, uh, using only 5% of atrial fibrillation uh, procedures. And in uh, 2028, we think that's going to count for 70%. So we're seeing an enormous shift there. Uh, some of that, of course, now has been driven by business and regulatory matters, uh, like the earlier, much earlier than expected approval of Boston Scientific's Farapults uh, in the U.S., so it, which has really jumped started a lot of this, along with Medtronic's approval. Um, on the just the pure business side of things, Boston Scientific, as it ramped up to meet the American market, uh, also solved some of its supply chain issues that were used to backlog and allowed them to meet demand that already existed in that market. Uh, Medtronic has also reported similar improvements. So we're seeing all of these work together, the, those issues of safety, uh, the greater availability and the approvals in the market and the changes in the recommendations for how uh, cardiac ablation in general and PFA specifically should be used to treat these patients. David, can you talk about um, what changes you're seeing in referral patterns? Are you seeing more patients um, as a result of some of the guideline shifts? Uh, yes, def definitely seeing change in, in pattern of referrals, seeing patients earlier, um, seeing patients um, choosing um, earlier to, to come and have um, ablation procedures for their atrial fibrillation. Uh, and interestingly, the media um, uh, uh, Output following the lease, the, the release of P, um, PFA a couple of years ago means that we're seeing patients um, seeking out our institution um, uh, as opposed to local institutions where it wasn't available because they want specifically to to have PFA rather than other forms of, of ablation. Um, so we we've always seen a trend. I think yes, it's probably too early to see whether or not PFA has driven this because we were we were already seeing a trend of increased referrals for AF ablation. Um, but certainly, um, PFA is, is is driving a change, um, both from uh, our referrers and the patients themselves. Okay. Will you speak a little bit about what you're seeing in the in the EP market globally? 
So if we just look at it globally, the impact of PFA market on this global electrophysiology market has been quite transformative, especially as you can see in the pie charts, we see a shift in the ablation preferences. And if you look at what companies have said, for example, both Boston Scientific and Medtronic have reported that the rapid up of PFA has caused a faster than expected decline in the use of cryoablation. And um, Medtronic early on uh, kind of mentioned that its pulse select PFA system has been replacing both competitors RF systems, that's radio frequency systems, and its own cryoablation system, and both of them at about an equal rate. So this shift is kind of quite telling as it indicates that PFA is not just replacing a single modality, but it's actually in influencing the broader market landscape for ablation procedures. For instance, Medtronic in its first quarter of financial year 2025 reported a single mid single digit growth in their cardiac ablation revenues. And this growth was largely due to the uptake of their PFA device. This PFA growth essentially kind of offset the decline in the demand for their own cryoablation system. And so if you just look at this uh, pie chart, you can see that the market is seeing a clear transition from radio frequency and cryoablation to PFA as the preferred modality in the treatment of atrial fibrillations. And we can expect this trend to reshape the electrophysiology landscape in the years to come. I'd like to focus our conversation on market access. Dee, can you provide some insight on how payers are responding? We expect really a reduced healthcare resource use overall. As PFA is known for its efficiency and safety, this can lead to reduced healthcare resource uses. Um, so by minimizing complications, shortening procedure time, PFA is likely to reduce hospital stay, follow-up treatments, which is going to translate to cost savings for healthcare system and patients alike. So what are the payers going to do? What's CMS doing? It will have new technology premium pricing. So as a novel technology, uh, PFA may initially be priced at a premium. However, its potential to reduce long-term healthcare costs through fewer complications and retreatments can really justify its higher upfront costs. And CMS has recognized PFA and its new DRG payment structure, and that includes that premium pricing for new technology. So the good news is it's same coding and payments rate. The PFA procedures are often coded similarly to other catheter ablation techniques with the present CPT code for all the CPT nerds out there of 93656, and it's going to continue to be used. So this coding consistency really helps the reimbursement process. Um, and then let's talk about NTAP, that new technology add-on payment PFA has been recognized under the NTAP program. So that is going to provide additional reimbursement for new technologies that demonstrate substantial clinical improvement over existing treatment. So for fiscal year 2025, the maximum NTAP for PFA is going to be set at 65% of the average cost of the technology. So specifically, if we're going to go U.S. focus here, the NTAP is going to be $6,300 for Pulse Select and $9,700 for Ferripulse. So, um, and let's just kind of touch a little bit on the transitional pass through the TPT. Specific details for that are rather limited. So as you may know, the TPT program generally supports new medical devices for, for providing additional payments for a very limited time. And this helps kind of offset the cost of adopting new technology until they become more widely used and their overall cost decrease. So let's move away from the US for a moment and talk about Japan, China, and Europe. Well, that's generally good news. So in Japan, PFA received regulatory approval with systems like, we were talking Medtronic's Pulse Select that was approved for atrial fib. And this approval is expected to really facilitate a broader adoption and reimbursement in the region. Um, as far as China, you know, we touched on that briefly earlier. But information on the PFA reimbursement in China 
The reimbursement portion is a little less detailed, but the growing interest in the advancement of medical technology really suggests uh, potential future adoption and reimbursement frameworks. In Europe, PFA has been approved with systems like Ferropulse really being widely used, as David mentioned. And the CE Mark approved approval really facilitates reimbursement across European countries, and it supports the technology's integration into standard cardiac care. So generally, field pulse uh, ablation it is supported by NTAP for additional reimbursement. It uses those addition coding structures for streamlined reimbursement and reduces the overall healthcare cost by minimizing complications and hospital stays. So it makes it cost effective and efficient, which frankly, payers love. So it's, it's overall a real positive trend for reimbursement and coverage. David, you recently wrote a paper on the competitive or comparative costs of different types of catheter ablation for the NHS. What can you tell us about the cost for the UK healthcare system? Uh, thanks again. for it, It's an interesting point. It, AF, as you can clearly see, is a huge problem globally. You know, and we are barely scratching the surface of it, really. So the cost of treating AF is huge. It's only going to get bigger, um, uh, as will not treating it. Um, 1.4 million people with AF in England at a cost of, of you know, close to £2 billion pounds per year. So we are seeing a greater scrutiny in public sector healthcare in the UK when new and often more expensive technologies are introduced. So there's a justifiable need to ensure money is well spent. Um, we're increasingly being asked as physicians to report outcomes, which I think is com com completely justifiable following the introduction of these new newer technologies. And access is actually being restricted to a smaller number of high volume centres. Um, Private healthcare has taken a rather variable response in the UK. Some providers have refused to fund it at all, um, at least initially, and others are embracing it from the start without any problem. This has created a few problems. As I mentioned before, patients are actually self-referring for PFA and, and seeking it out. Um, and, and I've been excited follow the, following the publicity surrounding its launch. Um, and, but then come to realise that their particular insurance insurer won't fund it. Um, Thankfully, this is gradually improving, but it's not clear cut across the industry. I'm actually quite grateful to Claire Duxbury, a colleague from Boston, for her hard work in pulling this paper together. And this explored the cost effectiveness of using PFA technology and Farapulse in particular in the UK compared to cryoballoon as the, as the most frequently used alternative single shot technique for, uh, for AF ablation. Um, comparative data. Um, from recent cost-effective analysis and cryoablation by the National Institutes of Care and Health Excellence was used. And this provided a really solid, um, already reviewed background as to the costs of, of, of treatment of AF in general. Um, using the Farapulse catheter was more cost-effective across a wide range of components, including the need for repeat ablation, um, which has to be factored in, and the cost of complications. So overall, the the, the cost of using Farapulse was actually cheaper uh, in the first year than using um, alternative thermal technologies. Uh, so therefore, the widespread use of PFA, we felt was affordable for the NHS, as, as uh, um, more affordable for the NHS as uh, compared to existing treatment. What's next for PFA and the major players? Well, certainly all of the big medtech players are looking very carefully at their competitors' products, their own pipelines, and they have to act very quickly to grab a share of the market. If they can't roll out their own products, uh, you know, really in the next few months, they may do better by acquiring a smaller company that has a product that's closer to launch or one that could allow them perhaps to leapfrog the competition. So I think it's a setup for a lot of M&A activity. Uh, and we've seen that already, you know, that snapping up nimble startups provides a real advantage in speed and innovation. So Boston Science did in 21 with the acquisition of Farapults, a $550 million deal all in. Well, not a trivial sum. They'll book more than that in U.S. sales this year. And that doesn't include the previous three years of revenue out of Europe. So likewise, Medtronic's acquisition of Afera in 2022 which was $925 million, gave them a much stronger product than their internally developed Pulse Select, 
which has not received a particularly warm reception in the market in the US or in Europe, and has had some issues that kept it limited release in both locations for quite a while. Uh, Ferris anticipated approval in the next few months should provide a needed boost. Medtronic's been very clear they consider that to be their premium product. Uh, J&J's Veripulse, not an acquisition, has launched in the EU and Japan, and it's going to hit the US market soon. Uh, the question is, how much of what is really Boston Scientific's market right now in PFA, is it going to be able to claw back and how quickly? That leaves Abbott out in the cold. Uh, for the major players, it's not expected to get its product to market until 2027. And there isn't much indication that it's going to be two generations ahead of the current PFA systems, and that's probably where they'll be by the time it enters the market. A strategic acquisition could really help them protect a nearly $2 billion electrophysiology business, particularly as we're seeing that electrophysiologists have been quite willing to use PFA systems, Medtronic's and Boston Scientific's without mapping and navigation. And the other big three competitors, even if that were an issue, all of them are gonna offer their own mapping system within the next few months. So there are a smaller, several smaller companies that might be of interest as acquisition targets and just for how they'll change the market as they come into it. And that Those include Cardium out of Canada, Field Medical, Acutus, uh, Adagio and Cardio Focus. Um, Atricor and Pulse Bioscience are both also very interesting companies that have, have uh, unique systems, but they're in a slightly different segment with a focus more on surgical ablation. Uh, it's a, so it's a little different and doesn't directly address this huge growing market. Punkil, can you talk about how the landscape is looking in Asia? Landscape in Asia is actually very interesting and it's definitely poised for a significant growth. So at Clarivate, we are projecting that the Asia-Pacific region, which includes countries like Australia, China, India, Japan, Korea, will actually exceed the European market by 2027 or even sooner. Asia-Pacific market is expected to surpass the $1 billion market size in over next three to five years, which makes Asia a critical region for expansion over the next decade. So if you see China in particular, China continues to present both opportunities and challenges. It's a huge market, definitely. But the growing presence of domestic companies and local competition is something global players will need to navigate. So for example, as I previously mentioned, two companies, Jinjian Electronics and Hangzhou Denuo Electrophysiology, both received NMP approvals for their PFA devices earlier this year. And this gave them a first mover advantage in the Chinese market. However, the more recent NMP approvals for Boston Scientific and Medtronic's PFA devices mark kind of a critical moment as international players are beginning to enter the Chinese market. If you look at Japan, Japan is another important market in Asia, and it's projected to see robust growth in the PFA space. So we're expecting the market there to reach $300 million in size within the next five years. So you know, Julianne, um, with, the, with these recent approvals and continued growth potential, Asia Pacific is quickly becoming a pivotal region for future of PFA market. And market access in Asia will actually be very essential for companies that are aiming to expand in the PFA market. However, they'll need to definitely navigate a landscape that includes both regulatory complexities and domestic competitions, especially in markets like China. David, um, what's on the horizon for growth beyond what we've talked about today? Uh, well, certainly there's an application beyond the left atrium for, um, for the use of PFA. And we've used it um, successfully for treatment of ventricular tachycardias, for instance, um, here at, uh, at Papworth. Um, uh, there was some concern initially regarding um, using it on for, for other rhythms such as, as right atrial flutter in terms of um, coronary artery spasm. Um, there seems to be you know, a way around this. It's not something that was ever really assessed with other technologies. Um, so it was never really sure whether this was something that was specific for this technology or just something that was, was looked at closely at the time. So I think there is uh, certainly scope for the use of PFA for most of the arrhythmias that we treat. Um, perhaps not all. You can certainly think of um, a few 
uh, instances where you might want the more localized use of radio frequency, but I, but I, but I think we can certainly see this technology being used more widely. I, I would just say when you look at what's happening, the opportunities, yes, right ahead, but stay tuned for that push pull between the upfront costs and the long term benefit, both asked from um, the payers and 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 also for some of the health systems, they're going to want to see some long term data. So that's going to be I think the next step that we're going to be looking at. That what's really going to be telling here is what happens with Johnson and Johnson and Abbott. Um, you know, both are lagging now in the US and in Europe. J&J, as we said, could turn it around with Veripulse um, obtaining FDA approval shortly. Um, and it has presence now in the Japanese market. Um, Abbott's got more ground to make up and much later approval. Uh, so unless they make a clever strategic acquisition, like we said, um, they have perhaps 90% of their $1.9 billion electric physiology business at risk. A big catheters mapping and the pull through for their access business. Uh, so I, I think they they have the most at risk and probably Boston Scientific and Medtronic right now have the most to gain. We have so many great questions from the audience and only 10 minutes left. So I'll try to summarize and prioritize, but please know that if you've submitted a question that we don't get to today on the webinar, we'll get back to you directly. Um, so one question. Um, what factors are preventing more rapid adoption of PFA given all of the clinical advantages that we've talked about today? Um, David, I'll have you comment first and then, and then um, hand it to Punkil. Um, well, from our perspective, um, uh, and was an advantage to us uh, at the time it was launched in, in the UK was the, the need for general anesthesia. Um, we're very fortunate here at Papworth that having uh, ready availability of anesthesia for these cases. But uh, as I mentioned earlier, the, 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 the energy pulse that's delivered is really quite stimulating to surrounding structures, although not damaging. So you get a lot of um, muscle twitch, um, you get nerve stimulation, so you're going to get diaphragmatic twitch. And given that you're delivering 30 to 50 applications at a time, this is really quite uncomfortable for patients. Um, I think there is certainly a move to try and lighten that um, anesthesia, even deep sedation or, or, or conscious sedation. Um, but at the moment, I think general anesthesia is probably the main restriction to uh, the main constraint and more widespread adoption. I can talk about one more factor. So thinking about like um, the situation in cost country constrained um, regions like India, for example, um, the upfront cost about these of these uh, PFA devices is going to be a limiting factor. So uh, a facility to perform PFA ablations has to install these uh, capital equipments, right? And so in cost constrained countries like India, it's going to be difficult for these facilities to kind of purchase the capital equipment uh, or else they would have to rely on these manufacturers to give it out to them on loans or rentals it's not just that but if you look at how the cost that the patient would have to bear versus like what happens if they just keep uh, on antiarrhythmic drugs right so this cost is going to be uh, very high for these patients to pay especially when there is no reimbursement and they have to pay it out of their own pockets so that's also going to be a limiting factor great thank you um, the next question I'll, I'll read and Dee, I'll ask you to comment first. Um, how do you see the Canadian healthcare market evolving in terms of adopting the latest PFA technologies, considering the challenges of a publicly funded system? Mm -hmm. uh, that's a great question. And some of it really reflects some things that Punkel just said, that upfront cost is going to be an issue. The other aspect that you have with countries like Canada and even the US is this vast rural area. So you have hospital systems that may not be seeing enough patients to justify going forward with a greater upfront cost. What's really gonna be necessary for Canada to really get on board and not that they won't get on board, but is, is just like we've been seeing in, in Europe, there needs to be some long-term justification and some real pharmacoeconomic modeling to show a substantive benefit in outcomes over the period of time that justify the cost. 
But when you're able to start showing that they can get off the other medications and and that overall there's there's not that follow up and hospitalization and side effect management, I do believe these countries will get on board, including Canada. But it's that initial spend it will take a bit more time in more cost constrained markets. David, the next question is more clinical in nature, so I'll direct it to you. Are there means of assessing tissue electroporation during treatment between pulses so that lower voltages can be used and minimize surrounding tissue reaction? Um, and what uh, level of voltages would be able to, to cause that? Uh, that's a really interesting question. And the short answer is no. Um, you, you assess the end effect. So you assess the vein for, for isolation and, and exit block. Um, the, there's actually a really narrow window um, of, uh, of effectiveness um, that has been painstakingly um, derived through bench work and, and, and other studies as well. The amount of energy that's delivered is actually not a, a, a user adjustable uh, factor. Um, the recipe is basically created for us and, and, and it's just a, a push a button and, and deliver the same energy source. Um, so um, the, the short, so as I said, the short answer to that, uh, to that question is no, there is no way of adjusting it. Now, other, um, other technologies and other manufacturers have a slightly different pulse duration and different energy sources as well. And it may be that, that um, different stimulation thresholds are achievable. Um, but it's not impossible to eliminate it. This is our final question before we run out of time. What do you see as the future of dual energy systems? Will they replace PFA? It's, again, a very interesting question, and I'm not sure we have the answers just yet, just this early on. I think, I think there is certainly grounds to believe that PFA will significantly replace other technologies along the way. Whether a dual energy source um, uh, is going to be that important. I think for certain applications, it will be necessary. But I think the the need to retain radio frequency is going to get smaller and smaller as the technology is adopted across different applications. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to our panelists and for all of you for joining our conversation today. Mm -hmm.